prices speak very loud to customers, very, very loud. And so we should be listening to what they say, right? And incorporating that into what we do. Coffee's for closers only. So we've established my proposal is sound in principle. Now we're just haggling over price. <laughs> Let's see how much we're going for on eBay. I mean, it's the same as Dunkin' Donuts. Cost 15 times the price. Welcome to Impact Pricing, the podcast where we discuss pricing, value, and the justifiable relationship between them. I'm Mark Stiving. Today, our guest is Marco Bertini. Here are three things you want to know about Marco before we start. He is a professor at Estade in Barcelona. That's a university, by the way, a really good one. He's co-author of The Ends Game, How Smart Companies Stop Selling Products and Start Delivering Value. Uh, his co-author is Oded Konigsberg. And here's this one. He used to play professional basketball. Welcome, Marco. <laughs> Thank you very much. I'm actually the proudest of the last one there. It didn't last very long. It's got to be a huge deal, right? Not very many people get to play professional basketball. So that's It was cool. a big deal at the time. Um, and then I got injured, you know, and that, that was the end of that career. Yeah, yeah. And you had to stick with academics. Oh, God, how horrible. So, <laughs> hey, how did you, uh, how'd you get into pricing? So, um, wow, the, 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 sort of the short version of that story is I was doing my MBA, uh, actually at uh, my rival school now, a school called Yese, which is across the street from uh, my current employer. And um, so one of the visiting professors there at the time was uh, a chap called Robert Dolan, uh, who wrote the book, uh, Power Pricing. Uh, and, you know, I got to speak to, speaking to him and uh, he got me interesting both, interested both in uh, doing a PhD and the topic of pricing. So the rest is history, so to speak, that I went to do my PhD at Harvard Business School. And a bit, a bit different to him, I got really fascinated with this sort of um, paradox, at least in my perspective, that prices are, you know, to economists, they're the summary of all information that you want in a marketplace. But at the same time, if you have any training in psychology, you get to learn pretty fast that there is so much psychology so much sociology behind prices. So I found that sort of dichotomy uh, very, very interesting. And I started researching from there and, you know, it takes me to the day. Yeah, the whole behavioral economics side of business is, uh, is really fascinating. But, but that's actually not what your book is about, which is interesting. Well, you know, so, yeah, so I, I did, so my PhD was in, uh, in, in management with a sort of background in decision science. That's a, at the time what behavioral economics was called, a much more boring name. And then, so that's kind of my, my, my origin. But then working with Oded, you mentioned him before, he's the co-author of the book. He comes from operations. So it's a very, very different background to me. And then the mixture of our two sort of heads discussing the topic of pricing, we came to something that, as a matter of fact, actually has a lot of psychology in it. Uh, it's not officially, we don't talk about behavioral economics, we don't make it explicit, but there's a lot of consumers and a lot of behavior in there. But of course, a lot of things that come from the operations transition uh, tradition, such as inefficiencies and waste. Yeah. It, and so the name of the book is The Ends Game. And I'm going to make the wild assumption that came from The Ends Justify the Means. Absolutely. Your, your, your wild assumption is completely uh, accurate. Okay, so give us the overall 30-second, uh, what's this book about, um, and why does anybody care? Okay, so maybe it's a little bit longer than 30 seconds. Um, <laughs> first, the first observation, when you talk, and I'm sure you've experienced this, when you talk to organizations about pricing, they tend to focus mostly on the pricing decision, right? Should it be higher, should it be lower? So the number decision. Or then and I always thought that there is a much more important strategic decision that comes beforehand which is really about, hold on a second, before I put a number on something, what should my customers actually be paying for, right? What is the metric decision? Because I think that we, we thought it dictates a lot of things. So from there, okay, we looked around. And again, as, as I think you know, you find books on subscriptions, you find books on pay as you go, you find books on pay for performance, and everybody talks about these things and everybody's excited, but nobody puts them together, right? Right? Observation number two. Observation number three, we are marketing professionals or marketing professors. And so we said, let's think about this from a customer perspective. 
right? And if you look at it from the customer perspective, this metric decision really, really affects them because it allocates the risk in any transaction. And if you want later, we can go more into it. But basically what we discovered is that when you think of it from a customer perspective and how do customers derive value, the ends to the means they're looking for, then all of these models out there actually fall into one very nice, neat line. And we kind of got excited about that and we decided to write a book on it. That's, that's actually really cool. Now, I, I got to say, in all honesty, I didn't even think about the question, what do you charge for? until I started studying subscriptions and in particular SaaS business models, right? Because the thing about a SaaS business model is once I'm charging you for software, now I can charge you for absolutely anything, right? Is it a user? Is it a license? Is it a click? Is it a download? Is it a gigabyte, right? There's a gazillion things I can charge you for. And now it becomes a conscious decision. But what I found most fascinating is once you realize that, then you can go back to every single business and say, you had to make the decision. What are you going to charge for? Right. Was it a conscious decision or was it just, this is what everybody's always done in the past. And so this is what I'm going to do in the future. And yeah. So, so yeah. Where, go on. Go ahead. Go on. Nope. Your turn. I was just going to add that. I think you're absolutely right. I mean, it's, and usually it's not a conscious decision. I think, right. There's a, there's a, there is a, there is an element of what is the tradition in our industry but I think also, I believe if you try to uh, scratch to the surface of that tradition, what is happening is that um, we know this from a cost, cost plus tradition, right? Whatever comes in in terms of inputs comes out in terms of outputs in a business because it's very easy for me to account for this. So I charge for products because my components and raw materials kind of come that way. I do costing based on products. So the easiest thing for me to do is just put a margin on that and then, you know, and let it be. Um, and I also would agree with you completely. When you start scratching the surface, you realize that SaaS models, SaaS industries, of course, are perfect for this. But if you look at it from a customer perspective, that question is literally applicable to anything that you sell, yeah. almost by definition, right? And then if, you, you know, if you've got an eager company and you've, you're curious and inquisitive, then you can start having a nice discussion around uh, if we're promising our customers, if we're customer focused and we're promising our customers that we're going to deliver them this satisfaction because we promise ends in our marketing material, what are we doing charging for anything other than those ends, right? And if we do, because we have to, I understand that, what are the consequences of that? And most companies don't necessarily uh, think that way, I think, intuitively. Yeah, I think we could talk about this for hours and we just might, by the way. Um, <laughs> but, but I want to start by asking, do you have in your mind or do you teach a definition of value? So what does value mean? Um, when, you, when you think of ends, that's the value, right? Yes. So what's value to a customer? So, yeah, so I think it, uh, I mean, being academic, my answer is going to be, it depends. Uh, it, yeah. it, it, it depends in the sense that it, uh, in, my, in a classroom, it really depends on what the kind of things that I want to focus on. So, so um, I guess in the simplest form, uh, I know that my students, my executives in a classroom will think about value in terms of like magnitudes. How much do I think something is worth to me? something along those lines, right? And so when I know that's going to be the case in the classroom, I'm always very careful to tell them that at least you've got two dimensions here. One is a dimension of magnitude, right? Which is perfectly fine. Uh, and then we can decide how much of that magnitude do we want to appropriate as a business. But then also there's a, whole, there's a whole dimension around the metric itself, which led to this book, which is really about risk alignment, okay? And, um, and, both, and those two things, by the way, are very, very important from a customer perspective, because if you think about, you know, if we think about something we say all the time, um, we say to companies, you know, there is such a thing as an objective value, your product delivers a certain amount of value in the best possible conditions. And then there is a perception of value that the customer may have. And that perception is typically inferior right? Because of lack of information, whatever that may be. Okay. So then I'm very careful to say, okay, that perception that is smaller is exactly based on these two dimensions. One of them is perceptions about the mean, how much value does something give me? And then perceptions about the variance. How likely is it to actually, am I likely to achieve that mean, right? That expectation. 
And it, as a business, I need to work on improving those two things, making the expectation, the mean, reach the reality and reducing that variance if I can, because if I reduce that variance, and I'm being technical, I suppose now, anybody who's risk averse with a big variance stays away, right? And most of us are risk averse, but if I'm able to sort of take the risk off the customers, they're more likely to join the marketplace, they're more likely to buy from me and just better things just happen overall. Okay, I loved what you said, but going through my mind are counter examples. And I'd love to hear you talk about them and explain why they, why they aren't. Uh, most of us use cell phones nowadays. Yep. And in the old days, we might have paid by the minute. And nowadays we have a bucket of minutes. So instead of me paying for my usage or paying for the real benefit I'm getting, I'm now paying for the certainty that I'm not gonna get overcharged or have to pay hundreds of dollars when I make too many phone calls. Yeah, so I think there's a number of things you could talk about here. So one of them is, 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 is this taxi meter effect that you're alluding to, right? I don't really like being charged on a go basis and I really don't like having surprises in my bill. So to the risk of being tautological, I could say, well, what is the real value that you're looking for in these sort of situations is one of them is certainty. So when you value certainty, then you have to price in a certain way to deliver that particular kind of value, right? Uh, an analogy may be somebody who tells me, Marco, I read your book and I really like what you're saying. However, I just like to own a car. I really, really get enjoyment from owning a car. And I say, well, you've answered your own question. If the value driver, if the ends you're looking for when you're buying a car is, is ownership because you just like the feeling of owning one, then you're right. You're, com you're completely aligned, right? And then another issue with the mobile, going back to the mobile, the cell phone plans, is that I, I, unless I'm mistaken, a lot of the times these, these minutes can carry over, right? Sometimes. From one month to the other, which is exactly, which makes it a usage-based model because your consumption, your payment, right? Is adapted to the actual usage because these minutes roll over. Right? So at the end of the day, uh, it becomes a usage-based model. And you see this not only in cell phone plans, but also like um, in some of these, um, um, what are they called? Consumables sort of subscription services, like yep. uh, an instant ink, right? For, 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 for printers. Yep. Yeah. Nice. Nice. Okay. So I like your tautological argument. I'm going to steal that um, from now on, right? It's, it's what you wanted. And, and it's kind of like, um, it's kind of like being an economist and saying, what's a util, right? A util is what you maximize. It's what you want. so you made a decision, you maximize your utils, right? It's a, it's a cheap way out, but it works. <laughs> it's uh look it's uh, uh depend on the depend on your audience it can work otherwise they come back to you and ask you a harder question then you try to find your way out of that one <laughs> right but but in the end I, I actually work with a bunch of companies who um who in the tech world who sell software probably middleware type stuff and one their clients one of their biggest problems is yeah. the certainty question right yeah. i, I want to know that i'm not going to get charged a million dollars at the end of the quarter and, and so that just becomes something they value and something that we have to address as we put together the pricing model. So, so I got to ask you, what's the difference in your mind between a business model and a pricing model? Okay, so we were very, uh, this is a good question because we were very careful in the book. I believe it didn't slip out in the book. I don't think we use the word business model in the book, I believe, uh, because I remember all the time while writing it. So a business model to me, is a word that is typically used for the stuff that we talk about in the book. Uh, however, it's to me personally, it's a bigger concept, right? We're talking about not only whatever decisions you make to generate revenue for the business, but also whatever decisions you make to manage uh, the cost structure of the business, your sourcing plan, your logistics. So it's basically the ins and outs in a business, right? So I tend to focus more on the revenue side and I guess I could use a term revenue model or pricing model. Uh, I, tend to, I tend to like the word revenue model more uh, for a couple of reasons. Um, one is more personal and one is more pragmatic. The more personal reason is that at least the course that I teach and the stuff that gets me excited is getting companies to, to think about and reflect on how they take whatever they make for customers all that goodness they create for customers 
and how they convert that into revenue eff efficiently. So I, I like that question. In fact, that's the way I start my courses. Uh, and, then, and then pragmatically, when you talk about pricing as a word per se, unfortunately, it's a pretty loaded term uh, and it's loaded in a negative uh, sense. Uh, it tends to be seen as a, as a more tactical sort of decision, a more short term decision. It tends to have that baggage and so to escape it, you know, I often try to stay away from the term. And I think actually the word price may actually not be in the book either for that really? same reason. I, I am not 100% sure, so I don't want to bet on it. But I, I remember having that discussion and trying to steer away from it. Nice. Well, it's kind of interesting because the, um, the thing you talk about, which is what are you going to charge for? I clearly and consistently call that a pricing metric. Right. And that's very valid. For? Yeah, for sure. Absolutely. I think it's becomes uh, semantics to some, some extent. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 Cool. Um, okay. So I, one of the things I teach in one of my courses, it, and I'm asking this because I think it might be you, I have no idea, but the theater in Spain, the charges by the laugh, was that you? That's in the book. Uh, Is that's it? in the book. Nice. Yeah, it's definitely in the book. And it's not me. It's not me, but it's uh, one of my one of my friends and good colleague of mine is uh, is uh, he ran that experiment with Teatro Neo. It's a it's a theater uh, right very close by to where I live, maybe about twenty minutes twenty minutes from here. Uh, yeah, so that's a good one. Did you uh, the paper laugh right? Yes. Did you have you been to that theater? Yes, of course. So with my okay. kids several times. And when you go, do you try not to laugh? Well, so the thing about that is that it, right now it's not running. So it's something they trial for a while, okay? Uh, and they tried pay per laugh, right? And I'll go back to your question in a second. Eh? And then they've also tried pay per love. I don't know if you've got that. Have you ever seen the video? Use that in the classroom. If you don't, you should. Mm -hmm. It's the evolution of pay per laugh, where they basically take your sense of humor as a proxy for you know, affinity with a potential significant other. So when you go into the theater, you select the gender that you're interested in, uh, and then they show you affinity in terms of laughing with five potential matches. And then if you pay, and the other person pays, you get to meet each other. It's right? like match.com. <laughs> but through laughter. Now, uh, you raise a very good question. Should you try not to laugh? So, uh, um, I guess, well, one of the, actually, it kind of gets at one of the issues in the book. We talked about how there's this issue that outcomes and are not purely under the um, control of organizations. In many, many situations, the out, and especially in, in services, the outcomes that you're trying to achieve are a joint effort between the organization that provides a product or service, maybe third parties, but also customers. Think of healthcare, to a serious context, right? Uh, if I have a particular condition and I've been told that this treatment is really good for me, but then I don't take the treatment when I'm supposed to of how I'm supposed to, then I reduce the quality of the outcome and the company, unfortunately, bears all that risk. Okay. So um, we talk a lot about in, in the book about how you need to be able to have, think about outcomes that are quantifiable, that are verifiable, but also that cannot be tampered with. That is a very, very important condition. And laughter, for example, uh, is one of those things that unfortunately you can tamper with, right? Uh, yes. You can see somebody sort of being very stern and laughing from the inside as opposed to maybe somebody from Germany, right? More, more, much more stern as opposed to a Spanish guy is like, you know, cracking up. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> this will never work in Germany. So, <laughs> okay. I've got some Let friends. <laughs> Let's assume then that uh, a company says, oh my gosh, I want to go figure out what I should charge for or how do I get closer to the ends? I, I'm going to guess that you don't say jump to the end. It's a stepwise, step-by-step, here's how you're going to get there. What's the, what are some of those steps or how yeah. many are there? Sure. Remember that line that I was telling you at the very beginning of the interviews? That, that's, that's that journey, right? So just quickly, um, on the one hand, you've got these ends that customers are looking for. Uh, and then you think to yourself, if you put yourself in the customer's shoes, what conditions must exist in order to achieve value, satisfaction, and end? Well, if you think about it, very first thing, you have to, as a customer, I have to access 
a product or service. If I don't access your solution, I can't benefit from it eventually. Two, conditional on access, I have to consume it. If I don't consume it, I can't benefit it from, from it eventually. Conditional on access and consumption, it has to perform, right? Those three conditions together are necessary and sufficient in order to get value. And that's the theory in the book. And so if you step back, customers derive value from access, consumption, and performance. Okay, then look at your own business, okay? Um, is, you, you sell ownership because you sell stuff. Ownership is a pretty, pretty poor way of giving access. It's a very financially intense and inconvenient way of giving access. And by the way, it has nothing to do with consumption. It has nothing to do with performance. Okay, so um, like I was saying before, when you look at all these models around, subscriptions, memberships, they're access models. They're the first step in that journey. Uh, sharing, unbundling, pay as you go, those are consumption models. They're the second step in that journey. Uh, pay for performance, pay for results, call them whatever you want. These are, or pay for value, these are actual performance models, okay? And so we're very careful in the book to say that we're not ever claiming that the business is wrong and tomorrow you should be selling for performance. We have a whole section of the book based on what needs to happen in order to do that. But yes, we are pretty strong claiming that at the very least ownership models in this day and age, the technology that we have are pretty much inferior in most markets. And you should be somewhere along that journey, depending on technology, depending on your eagerness and all these sort of things. So you should be thinking about moving along that journey if you're not moving there yet. Exactly. Or if you haven't been moved by somebody else, you know? Yes. Yeah. Well, if you haven't done it, someone else is going to do it. So where do you put Google AdWords? Uh, Google AdWords. So depending on this, I mean, I'm not an expert in that area at, at all, so I don't claim to be one. But you know, I my sense of that space that it's it's been moving, it's been moving actually pretty quickly along that journey um, through the last few years, right? We had, and I and I always get the time, I always get the sequencing wrong. We were getting, we were paying for ads, then we were paying for people seeing the ads, then we were paying for people clicking on the ads. Then now we get this data that can tell us whether they're actually clicking and going to a website and then actually buying, putting aside the attribution issue, right? But you see how those models with data, with impact data is what we call it in the book, it's getting more and more refined towards actual outcomes that the company paying for the ad is looking for, which is, hey, is this ad actually making people buy? Before we were measuring, are they seeing my ad? Because seeing is a better, is a proxy of maybe them buying. Then we were paying for, are they clicking to my website? That's a better proxy than seeing the ads. And now we're trying to see if we can pay for actual, you know, um, browsing behavior, and then maybe even actual basket size and whatnot, right? Yep. So what I love about that example, in fact, I love your explanation of it too. As you go along those steps, you could almost imagine each of those steps is performance, right? Because I want to pay you when someone sees my ad. Oh, no, no, I want to pay you when someone clicks on my ad. Oh, no, no, I want to pay you when someone pays me money, right? So each of those is a different level of performance, a different ends, essentially, for what I'm after. Well, we, if I may, we, we are a bit careful with this. We call ends, performance, what the customer is actually looking for, right? The question is whether I know what that is in the sense that I can measure it or I have to rely on a proxy, right? And so we distinguish between actual ends and proxies. And so in the, in the case that we're talking about here, what seeing an ad is clearly a proxy. I'm okay paying for that proxy because I think it's closer to what, sorry, I'm okay paying for that proxy, but ultimately the advertiser they're looking for cash from transactions and nobody doubts that, right? But I'm happy to pay for the eyeballs because I think it correlates somewhat with those transactions. But the moment you come to me with a better proxy, I'm going to shift to that or I'm going to demand that you shift to that. And which is the whole, by the way, the whole issue around this online advertising that a lot of marketers are saying, well, it's, it's very measurable. But now all of a sudden, actually, it's, actually, it's also very murky. I don't exactly know what I'm paying for these days. Um, but show me the data because the data is there, right? Yeah. 
And, and so what I often teach, and I think it's perfectly consistent with what you just described, is I, I use the word value metric to say, this is how a customer measures the value of what we just delivered. And I use the word pricing metric to say, this is what we're going to charge for. And I think the value metric and the pricing metric need to be highly correlated with each other. And I think that's almost exactly what you just said. Yeah, I'm thinking on my feet now. I'm probably, because these are terms that are a bit, uh, I use them differently, Look, but I, I think exactly what you, I think those are the two dimensions we were referring to before. Mm -hmm. I think one is about aligning <laughs> when I make money. So do I make money when the customer gets benefit, right? And the other one is then how much of that. So one is risk and one is allocation. How much do I take? Yeah. <laughs> Excuse me. Marco, I am having so much fun and I think I could talk for hours about this, but uh, we're going to have to wrap this up. Let me, let me end with the, the final question. What's one piece of pricing advice that you would give our listeners that you think could have a big impact on their business? Uh, okay, so I think one piece of advice, I mean, I would have a lot, unfortunately, but I can only give you one. So one piece of advice that I would give uh, to listeners is um, don't, don't assume it's just a numbers game. This is one of the, my biggest pet peeves when it comes to uh, pricing. It is certainly a numbers game, but it's much, much more broader. So anything you can do to integrate whatever you do with prices with your overall branding or corporate strategy is well, uh, well worth taking the time to do it. Because as a psychologist by training, <laughs> uh, prices speak very loud to customers, very, very loud. Uh, and so we should be listening to what they say, right? And incorporating that into what we do. Nice. And I love the phrase, prices speak loudly to customers. That's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. So Marco, thank you so much for your time today. If anybody wants to contact you, how can they do that? So through LinkedIn, of course, it's like a common uh, means that we're using these days, not to use the word end. Uh, and uh, also through my website, I have a website called uh, www, if we still use www, uh, marcobertini.com. Very easy. Excellent. And I assume it's spelled the same way your name is. Correct. Absolutely the same. <laughs> all right. Episode 96, all done. Uh, to our listeners, would you please leave us a review? These are really valuable to us. Uh, and they help other people find the show. The Draft King wrote us a review. It said, actionable insights. Mark's content has made an immediate impact on my business as we adopted his value-based pricing mindset to go after a new market opportunity. Every episode I listen to has one or two great nuggets of insight that I can apply to my job. Thank you, Draft King. Also, please don't forget to join our free community. Uh, you'll find that at community.championsofvalue.com. That's where you'll get access to all of the content that I put out for free. Those are my memes, my blogs, my podcasts, my videos. If you have any questions or comments about this podcast or about pricing in general, feel free to email me, mark at impactpricing.com. Now, go make an impact 